Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, not your Mercedes. How's your prayer life? It takes work living for Jesus. Say anything you want to me. I'm leaving. The Holy Spirit's with you. Don't pull back so you can win. I have never met anybody that lived that did not need to forget something. I have never met anybody that did not need to forget somebody. Example, are you ready? School teacher. Come on. Every one of you had great school teachers except one. Right? I had a math teacher in grade nine. Number one, none of us could understand her. Number two, we did not know she was teaching math. And number three, she never showed up to class, except the day she gave tests. And when we left, we all decided we should forget her. How many of you have ever had a speeding ticket that you would like to forget? I am married to somebody who has had speeding tickets, and I make sure she does not forget. <laughs> Philippians chapter three, verse 13, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to take hold of it. Take hold of what? The prize. The prize of what? When, when God says to you, well done, good and faithful servant. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Watch this, forgetting what is behind, straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called. I remember doing track and field, and I remember also doing gym class, and we had the laziest gym teacher in the world. If you're a school teacher, I have the highest respect for you, but there are some bad teachers. I will not mention my school teacher's name because Mr. So-and-so would not like it. But whenever he wanted to have a cigarette, he would make us run cross country. And what he would do is he would sit on the, the, the hood of his car and he would light a cigarette. And he would say, now, you need to be back before this cigarette is finished, okay? And what he would do is he would say, now you have to run through the ravine and none of you can cheat. And back then, we would go out and we would run as hard as we could, and there's a hill, and the first part of the thing, we would run down a hill, and we would slide down the hill as fast as we can, a huge hill that we would toboggan on everything, and we'd run through the woods, run across a creek, get back, and we knew we had to have wet shoes so he would know that we did this. So we run up, and then when we get to the hill, we're out of breath, we've already run over a kilometer and a half, and all of a sudden we're going to go to the hill and we're looking at the hill and some of us would just stop and others of us would run as hard as we could. I would run as hard as I could because I was always terrified that his cigarette would be finished. And we would come into the parking lot after probably running over two kilometers, just huffing and puffing not knowing that he was on his second cigarette. <laughs> and he would say, keep running. You still got quite a bit more to do because he didn't want to teach gym class. You know, the Bible says forgetting. Let, let's deal with forgetting here. The word forgetting here is not, it, Paul knows that some stuff you don't forget. He knows that. And, and this whole thing, you know, oh, you can forget anything, that's not true. 
I, I've gone through some problems with my eye this year. I'm not going to forget that. But what Paul means really in the Greek, in the translation from the Greek really means this. You learn from the past, but you press on and you don't let the past stop you. But you let the past help you. Did you hear this? A lot of us have gone through some hard times this year. Some of you have gone through relational, some of you have gone through career stuff, some of you have had health, some of you financial. Some of you have heard voices inside you. Let, let me share this with you. The craziest thing about this is when Paul says forgetting, what he's saying is learn. Take, take, take the good of this situation so that you can plow on into the future. But don't let it stop you. Don't let it stop you. Here, here's the craziest thing, so many times you and I, because of something happening, it paralyzes us from doing something great in the future. We have a negative experience that we don't learn from in order to make it a positive experience in the future. What we do is we stay frozen. Craziest thing is he says three things. He says, I don't only want you to forget but I also want you to strain on. And then he says the third one, press on. Now, now watch this, okay? My, my arms are uh, 36, 37 length. They're really eight arms, really long, okay? And when, when I was in school, I ran track and field. And I ran sprint and I ran, um, uh, you know, stuff like that. And when I was running sprint, my, my coach, he taught me something. He said, you have a gift from God. And I thought it was speed. And he said, no. He said, you got long arms. He says, when you get to the finish line, he says, I don't care if anybody is beside you or not. You're not going to know because you're not allowed to look. You got to look just at the finish line. But he said, when you get to the finish line, he says, I always want you to press your arm out because your arm is so long compared to a normal human. <laughs> and so I would be running as fast as I could. I'd be straining. I would be pressing through. I would be, oh, and I would, oh, I'm going to win. I'm going to smoke this. And at the very end, when I'm coming across the finish line, I would always dive, which I'm not going to do today. And I put my hand out like this. And you won't believe this, how many times I won a race by half an inch. Just because God gave me ape arms. <laughs> now, can, can I just share this with you? Paul, he says, you gotta strain. You gotta press on. And, and these, these theologians who are hypocrites and heretics who say, oh, living for Jesus is going to be so easy and so simple and you never, they're not reading the Bible. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, not your Mercedes. Sorry, Lamborghini. Can I, can I share this with you? It takes work. Living for Jesus. There's five things that has helped me and continues to help me, and I wish I've arrived at any of these, and I haven't arrived at any of them. Number one, I know going into 2019, I need to get humility. Jesus had humility. Jesus is dying on the cross, and, and the guy who nailed him to the cross, one of the soldiers, he looks at the soldier and he says, hey, I forgive you. You're dying crucifixion, and yet you have humility. The Bible says, if my people will humble themselves and seek my face, then I'll lift you up. The Bible says, when you're humble, God will lift you up. Here, here's the craziest thing, if there's anything that Billy needs in 2.19, it's humility. 
I've had people who said to me, oh, you're so humble. And when they say that, I say thank you. And then I walk away and say, oh, if only you knew. But the fact is this humility drives us and presses us and strains us towards Christ. Number two, get help. If you think you can do it on your own, you're fooling yourself and you're lying to yourself. We all need Christian brothers and sisters, and that's the truth. This is why I believe in small groups. I believe in 35 South, 45 South, um, table talk, all these different things. I believe that, you know, if, if you're a parent and you do not have your children in youth program or tweens program or the kids program during the week and on Sunday, don't come to me when they're not serving the Lord later in life. We need help. If it wasn't for a good youth program in my church and good youth counselors and godly parents also, I would not be serving the Lord today. The, the, the small groups, 12-step, divorce recovery, anger management. One of the nicest guys in our church, John, teaches anger management. It's terrible going there, how they destroy the room every week and we have to rebuild it, but <laughs> thank God they get it out of their system, okay. And the rubber pads don't help on the walls, but that's all right, we're working with them. We have divorce recovery. We have all these groups, and somebody says, this church is full of groups. Yes, why? Because we need help. We have AA across the road, and we have everything. Why? Because we recognize we need to forget what is behind. We need to press and strain on towards the prize of Christ. And we need help. Amen. Well, Jesus didn't need help. What do you call the disciples? What do you call the disciples? Get help. Number three, get healed. Get healed. Do you know that uh, I was blind for four months this year? I, I can see now. Um, I cannot read very good with my left eye yet, but it will come. But I can see, and, and beautifully I can see, but I cannot, but four months I was blind this year. Uh, two, two, uh, 14 days I was flat on my face, couldn't get up off my, I wasn't allowed to, I was like this for 14 days. Somebody says to me, well, you know, like, man, you, you, you must be really cautious now. How, how can you be cautious when you're married to the kind of woman I'm married to? I mean, last night she says, okay, when are we going downhill skiing? And when are we going to be doing this and that? And, and, and you know, and this, I tried this because I don't want to go downhill skiing. I don't like snow. I don't like cold. I said, you know, my eye. She said, you can't use that as a skew. So here, here's her paraphrase. Forget what is behind because I'm going to press you on and you're going to strain. I use this one line, you know, I'm starting to get old. She says, yeah, right. She says, no, 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 no. See, here's the craziest thing. We not only need to get healed, but we need to take what is good from it, right? I am more into divine healing today than I've ever been. I am, and somebody says to me, but your eye, you were operated four times on your eye in 2018. Yes, and that even pushes me more into divine healing. I have the highest respect for doctors and medicine and hospitals and nurses and, and all those people who work there. I, I, I thank them. I write them notes, everything. But I want you to know something. Going through what I went through in 2018, I am more into divine healing. Why? Because I did not let my illness stop me from going towards Christ, but I let my illness press me and help me strain on towards Christ. Number three, 
get healthy. There's a difference between getting healed and getting healthy. Illustration, a few years ago, not here at the church, but at another church, a pastor was telling me about this man in, in the church who was very large, and he had a massive heart attack. And he had a um, quadruple bypass surgery. And the doctor said to him, look, you're going to die if you don't lose weight. And he said, doctor, thank you so much. He left the hospital and he started feeling really good because his heart started working really good. Now, God healed him of this heart attack and gave him a, a quadruple bypass and stuff like this, gave him a second chance. But this man refused to get healthy. He didn't lose weight. And sure enough, a few years later, he was back with another heart attack. See, a lot of us, we, we ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins, ask him to cleanse us, and he spiritually heals us, but we don't clean up our lifestyle to be spiritually healthy. I was wondering, what, what are you doing spiritually, physically, financially? Did you hear this one? Financially emotionally, career-wise, all these areas to stay healthy. That's when Paul says, press on and strain to get the prize. Let me take you to the last one, most important one, get the Holy Spirit. I can't do it on my own. Lord, you want me to forget? Forget what? I'll give you a list of what I think I should forget, but you give me your list also, Holy Spirit. And also, let me, show me what I should learn from this. Now, Lord, I, uh, Holy Spirit, I don't understand the straining part. What, in what area of strain? Well, here, here's one for you. How's your prayer life? When was the last time you went into a prayer life straining, calling on God in such a powerful way that heaven opened up and heard your prayer? When was the last time you pressed on, not only in faith, but in other things spiritually? That's where I need the Holy Spirit. That's where I need the Holy Spirit. And, and, and now I tell you this story. And it, this story, I worked at 100 Huntley Street. It, it was, I was uh, head producer and TV uh, director, all this stuff. Had a great time. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me one day. He said, you're going to become a young adult youth pastor. And I said, no, I'm not. And God said, yes, you are. I said, well, if that's you, God, then somebody's going to have to phone me. And this pastor phoned me and said, hi, I'd like you to come out to Edmonton, Alberta. Now, my, my brother used to live in Edmonton, Alberta, and he told me horror stories about like 33 below zero. You have to plug your car in in the wintertime or else it won't start into electric socket so that it heats and stuff. And he told me horror stories. And this guy phones me and says, I'd like you to come to Edmonton. And I'm going, ah. Right? Because I'm not forgetting what my brother has told me. And I said to him, well, I'll come for two years, because I knew it was God. I will come for two years. In those two years, it, it, I, I, the youth group and the young adult group grew. The young adult group uh, tripled in size, youth group. We saw young people coming to Jesus. That's all it was, was just seeing them come to Jesus and disciple. It was beautiful. I loved it. I met my wife out there. And I rescued her from Edmonton. And <laughs> we lived in an apartment. We, we, we didn't pay very much rent. Are you ready? We paid uh, $480 a month for rent. Can you imagine this? And in the building next to us was Wayne Gretzky in the next building. That's pretty cool, eh? He never came to our church. God have mercy on him. And all of a sudden, around a year into it, 
there was political problems in the church where, where the board of the church, the board of directors, and the pastor, the senior pastor, started to have friction and fights and arguments. And it was a power struggle. And I, I just stayed low. I was on pastoral staff and I stayed low. All I wanted to do was young adults, youth, and junior high, and to stay low. But the board of directors decided, no, no, no. We're gonna pull everybody in. And all of a sudden, they started taking cheap shots at the pastoral staff. And the senior pastor never defended us. Now, you take any cheap shot at any of the pastoral staff, and you and I, we will meet, okay? Nobody does that. But this pastor never did that. There's a church in Toronto called Stone Church. It's in downtown Toronto, still there on Davenport. And they phoned me and said, would you like to be associate pastor? Come, fly to Toronto. Well, when you're in Edmonton in the wintertime, flying to Toronto is like going to Florida. So we decided, so, so we came and, and, and they showed us around. They said, we want you to be associate pastor and you could come back to Toronto. And, and, <sighs> and all of a sudden we went back to Edmonton. And when we got back there, the board of directors of the church called me in to their board meeting and started to accuse me of stuff that I never did. And they were mean. And all of a sudden, I said to them, can I take a 10 minute break? And they said, yes. And I went into my office and I phoned the pastor at Stone Church and said, hi, we're coming. <laughs> and I went back into the boardroom and I said, hi guys, guess what? Say anything you want to me, I'm leaving. <laughs> now listen to this. We came to Toronto And when I got into Stone Church, the Lord taught me, you do not look down on the board of directors of Stone Church or any board in the future, but you learn. The board of directors of this church are absolutely amazing. The board of elders of this church are amazing too, two separate boards. And that experience, although I haven't forgotten, has helped me so I can press on and strain for the calling of Christ. And I know that when a board of director and I disagree, what we do is we go to the grill and we solve it. And we don't leave the grill until we have solved it. And when, when, when there is disagreement, which I don't think we've done this for a long time, I, that taught me what Christ wanted me to learn. And if I never went through that, I would never know how to deal with the board of directors and, and help them deal with me. Now, can I just share, you know what the opposite is? I have so many friends who are not in ministry today because the board of directors killed them or they killed the board of directors. And the reason is they didn't learn. Sometimes God puts you through a hell on earth to teach you so that in the future you can use it. Now watch this. Church at Edmonton phoned me five years or six years after I was gone, said, could you come out here and preach? And I said, are you kidding me? Now the senior pastor had gone and all those board members no longer were on the board 
And I came out and I preached. And bef- just, just during the service, the senior pastor, new senior pastor stood up and said, just so you know, we like to publicly apologize to you. When you were a young adult youth pastor here, we didn't treat you right, and we apologize. And then after service, I'm not joking, I came down the platform and there were old board members lined up with tears hugging me and asking for forgiveness. I couldn't believe it. But, but here's, the, here's the key. A couple of my friends, they left the ministry. But instead, I stayed in the ministry and learned from it so I could press on and strain to get the prize. Can I share this with you? Some of you have gone through really bad times in 218. And you're, you're nervous about 219. Holy Spirit's with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Don't, don't, don't pull back. Press on. Strain. So you can win. See, here's the key. When humility is there, Christ will be there. When you are living in his healing, he's there. When you're living healthy with him, he'll be there. But it's all because of the Holy Spirit. It's all because of the Holy Spirit.